Yeah, that's a fun one. You get this notice because um, it's illegal to record someone in California without their permission. <laughs> um, not so in other states. All right. Um, so we, we also do credit um, people getting sued, repossessions of cars, that sort of thing. Um, immigration, we have an immigration attorney. She's on maternity leave, but she's coming back soon. Um, so we're one of the very few free immigration attorneys in the region. Um, we also do some employment law. And then there's always, there's so many types of legal problems. Uh, we do some other stuff too. What do we not do? Uh, we don't do family law. Uh, if you go to the courthouse, most of the people in there are in there for family law reasons. Um, but for a few reasons, we, we don't do it. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. So how do we choose who we're going to help, how we're going to help them, how much we're going to help them? Um, we try to help everyone who's getting referred. So all of you are partners um, with an established referral network to us. So, so your people you send are priority. People can walk in off the street um, and seek our services or get referred from another partner. So when when we do get someone, um, we, like I said, we can just give them advice. Um, we can refer them out. We can do all sorts of things. But how do we decide when we're going to take a case, do sort of more stuff for them, um, give them more services? So it depends on all, all these factors here on the slide. Um, first of all, they have to have a case. Um, uh, first, we're legal aid. So we, um, we're spread fairly thin just by design. Um, there's not enough lawyers around for everyone. So we take cases that are going to make more of an impact on multiple clients. Um, any egregious cases, so, so really bad violations. Um, and then evictions are really going to impact a family potentially for generation. Um, so, so we prioritize those as well. Um, we also can't take clients who tell inconsistent stories because um, I have to speak for them. And if, if they can't tell a straight story, then I can't really do that. So sometimes we'll write letters for people um, also, who don't really want to talk to, don't want to have a lawyer talking on their behalf. So they want to avoid conflict. We can write letters in people's names, so it doesn't look like we're involved at all. Um, a big one is conflicts, and that is a legal term. So if we represented, um, we'll give an example, a, a man, let's say, in a, a family law dispute, which we don't do, if his wife came in for something else, we would be conflicted. We couldn't do that. So if we served landlords, then when that landlord's tenant came in, of course, the landlord would have multiple tenants. We couldn't serve any of those tenants. So for that reason, we actually don't serve any landlords. Um, so we do have conflicts, though, um, when we are helping someone and their spouse later comes in and they're, they've been in a divorce and it's just unrelated. So there's a few reasons why we can't help people. The other big one is income limitations. We're limited to 125% of the federal poverty guidelines. So that's very low. That's uh, $1,800 a month for a family of two. So uh, we can take some people above that, but um, we get in trouble if we do too much of that. Okay. Computer is working out. All right, so we're through that first part, and now I want to talk to you actually about all the housing rights stuff. So this is going to be somewhat of a repeat of last night, but uh, I want you all to sort of, if what I'm saying stirs up some cases that you remember and you were sort of bothered by and you want to ask me, um, just just chime in or say something in the chat and then Kelly will tell me. Um, so we're going to start with um, healthy homes and habitability. 
Um, then we're going to get to eviction laws and eviction protections, and then the special COVID eviction protections. So the first thing to talk about is discrimination. And let me just say before I get into all of this that I'm I'm just giving you a crash course. So this is sort of housing law 101. And you all aren't housing attorneys, but the idea is, of course, that you could identify this and make the referral or just know that something's wrong and uh, you know get the person to us or somewhere else if they don't want to talk to us that they could get some help. Um, so discrimination we see a lot. Um, so it is illegal to discriminate against tenants and folks applying to be tenants uh, on these bases. So um, it's okay to discriminate against someone if you don't like their color of their hair, because that's not a that's not an illegal basis. But it is if um, you don't like their sort of hair because they have sort of an ethnic type of hair do or something like that. Um, again, where people are from, the language they speak, their gender, that sort of thing. A new one a lot of people don't know about is Section 8 status. Uh, you'll see ads on Craigslist that say no Section 8. That is illegal. So um, folks having trouble there can, can get referred to us as well. Um, what are some examples of this? These are actual cases we've had. Um, children getting restricted. So the management goes, hey, your kids can't, can't be in this common area where everyone else can be. That's familial discrimination. Um, discrimination is also about disabilities. So if you have a disability and you, you're lucky enough to find in-home support staff, those people need somewhere to be able to park. So someone might tell you on the phone, oh, you know, my, my assistant can't, you know, I'm getting written up because of her parking is a big problem. Yeah, the, the landlord needs to accommodate, uh, make a reasonable accommodation for disabilities like that. Um, and then clear racism, homophobia, anti-immigration um, statements, written things. Uh, we see that a lot. People say, hey, you're, you're undocumented. You don't have any rights. They do. Uh, every tenant has rights in California. And then there's housing harassment. Unfortunately, we see this a lot. Um, all sorts of harassment, especially sexual harassment. Anytime there's sort of a power dynamic, uh, we see this. Um, a lot of times also landlords and tenants get on bad terms with each other and the landlord comes around, sort of yells at them about something, goes away. That sort of thing can be considered with a pattern harassment. Um, threatening people, that sort of thing, calling the police on them and the police come and there's nothing for the police really to do, but it's just to intimidate the tenant that happens as well. So all of all of this is illegal. There are things we could do about it. All right, there's a funny word habitability. Um, it translates into Spanish pretty well, but it's basically if a place if you're able to inhabit it, it's it's habitable. So I'll give you a bunch of examples of that. But this is the legal term for housing quality, really. Is the housing up to code? Is it is it good enough to live in? So landlords owe tenants um, a habitable rental unit. So who is the landlord? Who's the tenant? What's a rental unit? Sounds pretty simple, right? OK. Your landlord's the person you pay your rent to. but uh, a lot of people don't even know who their landlord is. There's just a guy who comes around and asks them for the rent money every month. Um, so that person is your landlord. If there's no lease, that's the person. I can look up the property owners of every, every property in, in Monterey or Santa Cruz County on public records. So I can see who actually owns it, who to send paperwork to. If you're a subletter, the um, the person you're paying rent who is themselves a tenant can be considered your landlord. Um, and then what's a rental unit? People call us and tell us, look, I know I have no rights because 
I live in a garage, so they can evict me whenever. Uh, incorrect. You are a tenant, you're paying rent. Um, wherever you're living, that's, that's called a rental unit. You have rights to eviction, you have rights to a habitable home. If the landlord is accepting money to a place that cannot be rented and is uninhabitable like a garage, um, they should give all the rent you've ever paid them back and we can help with that. So um, basically, you don't have to think hard about this. The answer is anyone paying rent and even some people who aren't um, to a landlord in California um, deserves all these rights and all the eviction rights that we'll get to later in the presentation. So what are examples of uninhabitable homes? Uh, famous clear examples are when there's no electricity or no heat or no uh, gas or water. Those are clear violations. They need to be fixed right away. Other times there's mold, which is very common, especially starting now uh, this time of year when it's raining. Uh, cockroaches, bed bugs, mice, that sort of thing. A lot of folks have leaky roofs, leaky doors, windows where you can see light through them. Those are all violations. And there's this idea that if you pay less in rent, you deserve a place that's sort of lower and lower quality. And that's, you know, to a large extent true. But there is a floor where if the quality is below that, the landlord's violated tenant rights. And so if any of these conditions are, are present, um, the landlord shouldn't be accepting full rent. Okay. So what do we do? Okay. Well, first of all, the other thing people should know is like sinks, doors, windows, washing machines, anything that came with the property, the landlord has to repair it if it breaks. We've all heard the term probably wear and tear. Um, that's accepted, right? So that would be, you know, rubbing of paint near the door, that sort of thing. But unless the tenant actually breaks the thing themselves, then the landlord has to repair it and pay for it. If the tenant breaks something, the landlord still has to repair it, but they can charge the tenant for it. Okay, so let me think. Someone comes into my office or they get referred uh, via the SRM and they have mold and it's terrible and their toddlers getting sick going to the hospital all the time. What do we do? Okay, what are the strategies? Step one is to write a letter to the landlord. Um, it's best to do it in an actual letter in writing. We give them a deadline when they need to fix the problem. If they don't do it, uh, we can help the tenant repair it themselves and deduct the price from their rent. They can withhold rent. They can say, hey, my place is only worth now 50% of what I pay because the heat doesn't work. Or they can just leave, break a lease. So all communication we stress with everyone should be in writing. Again, I'm telling you all this, not because you're going to give this advice to folks, but just so you know legally what people's rights are and how we enforce those rights. So this is step one of dealing with an issue in the home with someone already there. That was a demand letter, the first thing you see here. The other strategies are reporting to the county or the city officials um, and communicating with them and helping them along and making sure they follow through. Um, if it's a discrimination or uh, there's a disability, we would do a reasonable accommodation form. If that didn't get the landlord to fix the problem, then we would uh, potentially file a complaint with the state who has a special bureau that deals with housing discrimination. Um, and then there's the small claims court. So uh, if you, a tenant can win up to $10,000 in the small claims court, but uh, they'd have to bring their own case. There are no lawyers allowed. It takes about a month or two. And then there's a civil action. So that's when we would get involved actually take a landlord to court. So we have a case we're, we're doing now, for instance, where uh, there was a flood in a unit. Um, our clients didn't know about it. They moved in afterwards. Within a month or two, all their stuff was covered in mold. Um, it was a disaster. They had all these 
health problems. The landlord was just ignoring all their requests. They finally moved out a year later. Um, and then, you know, the landlord basically just gets away with it um, unless someone like us actually holds them accountable. So, so that's our, uh, that's one thing that we do. And I'll tell you uh, another thing I didn't mention when I was talking about what legal aid organizations do um, and when we choose cases. We don't take cases where there's a private attorney who's going to do the work anyway. So if there's a case where the mold was so bad somebody died, for instance, um, a personal injury attorney in the area would probably take that case because the valuation would be high. And then we wouldn't we wouldn't have to do it, and we could help many more people. So um, that's another thing that we think about a lot. All right, I'm going to take a little pause here and just see if anyone had like that brought up anything for anyone. You want to ask any questions about um, habitability or anything? I have a quick question. I was just curious. I know that you talked about like the discrimination um, component, and I was just curious what happens. Um, of course, it's still discrimination, but let's say someone's situation changes while they're in a unit. So, like for example, uh, I know that you gave the individual that needed like an aid, and like that aid, of course, would need a place to park. So, what if let's say that individual didn't need that assistance when they first moved into the property? and then started to need some kind of new assistance or let's say maybe they didn't have a child and then they had a child and you know there were a certain boundaries already set i was just curious like is do you have to provide like your landlord with written notice that you need that type of support if it wasn't part of the initial lease or what what that process would look like yeah sure um so in in that case and in in all the habitability stuff the landlord doesn't have to do anything until they know about it. So the first step is always informing the landlord and we want, we want to do that in writing so we can, we have proof that we did it. So if you move in somewhere and you need an accommodation later, um, you make a reasonable accommodation request, which is just, just a letter you write that says, I have a disability, please do this. And that triggers the landlord to, they have to legally engage with you in what's called an interactive process to figure out if they can uh, modify something or accommodate for you. Um, if they're just changing their procedures, like what day of the month they take your rent, because that's when you get your disability check, for instance, or um, allowing your assistant to stay in the guest parking spot longer than the two hour maximum, whatever that is, they need to engage in that process. And if it's not gonna cost them much, then they have to do something. So yes, you um, nothing has to be in the lease. Um, when you move in, that's fine. Um, the sort of the, the not so great side of this, but it is a strategy if, um, that's sometimes abused um, when people want pets or their, um, their doctors, they do have anxiety and they, they get an emotional support animal um, and their, their place doesn't allow pets. Often landlords will allow it if there's a reasonable accommodation request and that, that could be made a little stronger with a doctor's note included or signed by a doctor. So yeah, no, no requirements in advance. You just make that request. All right, let's move on. little freezing problem. Okay. <laughs> so we're on moving out and evictions. First thing, and I'm just going to go over this real quickly, is uh, security deposits have to be returned within 21 days um, from when people move out. And that's really under any circumstances. If you're evicted or anything, uh, you need to get that back within 21 days. You have to, the landlord has to give them a letter with every deduction itemized, including receipts. That almost never happens. Um, and landlords love to withhold whole deposits. So if they're just gonna paint the walls, um, clean the carpets, that sort of thing, they shouldn't really be withholding much money. 
Um, but the standard is the place needs to be as clean as when the person moved in minus some wear and tear. So um, if the landlord withholds the deposit or doesn't return it at all wrongly, you can win up to three times the security deposit in small claims court. That would be a very simple case um, if the landlord wrongly withheld it. The best thing for tenants to do is to take lots of photos when they move in so they have sort of that, that base evidence and then photos after they clean up when they've moved out. And um, that would be a clear, easy case. So we see this all the time. All right, I'm going to talk about eviction protections, and there's two really um, important and frustrating differences in the law between single family homes and multifamily homes. You hear this and you think of a house by itself and a big apartment building. And that's true. One of those is single family, the other is multifamily. But a lot of times around here, because we have a housing crisis, is lot, landlords rent rooms in single family homes. So if multiple people have dwellings in the same property, that, that converts it legally to a multifamily property. So that's why on this slide I have under um, multifamily, multiple tenants or families on the property or multiple rooms are rented by a landlord in a single apartment. Um, or, you know, much more simply, if there's a, you know, the same address like 430 Main Street A, 430 Main Street B, that um, those can't be separated legally and sold. So that's a multifamily property. The single family property, I guess it's a little easier to understand it that way. It's yeah, a standalone property with only one tenant on one lease, whether written or oral. So um, the differences are in a single family home, you have fewer protections. So that's why it's red. Um, you can be evicted with, for no reason, uh, landlord still has to give you notice in accordance with the lease or the agreement or if there is no lease agreement, at least 30 days. And there's not a real limit on rent increases. And then the multifamily, I'm going to talk to you all about the protections right now. They all apply to the multifamily housing. All right. When can someone be evicted? So everyone's afraid uh, they're going to piss off their landlord. They're going to get evicted. And to a certain point, that's true. Landlords can often truthfully check one of the right boxes to evict someone, but oftentimes they can't too. So if you're in a multifamily property, there's two just causes. There's at fault, and then the next slide is no fault. So we're gonna talk about the at fault. That's when the tenant is at fault. They've done something wrong. They've broken the lease. Now that's just substantial lease violations. If the lease you know, says, you're going to replace the smoke detectors and they didn't do that. Well, is that a substantial lease violation? I don't think so. Um, nuisance, which would be another funny legal term, which means, you know, if someone's having parties all the time and they're getting complaints by the neighbors, that sort of thing, um, or damaging the property, punching holes in walls, that sort of thing. Obviously not paying rent, classic, classic reason for getting evicted. And then illegal activity, and this one could be a little nuanced because if the cops get called, not necessarily illegal, right? If someone's arrested and has a crime charged against them and that happened on the property, that's illegal activity. We, cops get called a lot on um, bad domestic violence cases. So there are protections for victims of domestic violence. Um, exceptions to this rule. Um, it's best if the victim files a police report um, and tells the landlord, but um, it's good to know there's exceptions. Some landlords are real trigger happy when it comes to the illegal activity um, reason for eviction. Okay, and then no fault evictions. That's when tenant has done nothing wrong. Um, so if the owner wants to move in or their children, spouse, parents, or grandparents, um, that's a legal eviction. 
not if their cousins move in. So um, every one of these rules has some nuances to it. If the landlord wants to take the rental off the market, that is different than selling the property. Selling the property is not on any of these reasons. So I know that doesn't make too much sense because uh, if you're selling the property, you might want to be taking it off the rental market at the same time, but um, no. Uh, you'd have to, to take it off the rental market. The landlord would have to not want to rent it to anyone um, ever again or for a period of years. And then if the landlord wants to remodel or demolish the unit, this was abused. And so the law was updated because landlords were evicting people for this and then just painting the walls and increasing the rent for the next person. Now the landlord has to actually um, do work that's gonna take longer than 30 days and they're gonna need to get a permit from the city. Then they can evict someone for that. And then maybe with 30 days notice. Um, maybe. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about these general reasons for eviction are if someone's going to be evicted for a no, a no fault reason, they get 60 days notice if they've lived there more than a year and the landlord pays them a one month rent in cash or they don't charge them the last month of rent. The other thing we're gonna get to notices if there's an at fault reason, like a breach of the lease, um, you know, you got a dog and the lease says no dogs, um, the landlord should give you a three day notice and the tenant has three days to fix the problem. So stop having loud parties, get rid of the dog or else you have to leave. So the tenant should have time to fix the problem for one of these at fault reasons, unless it's not curable. Like if they're really, if they set fire to something or, um, you know, okay. Evictions. So eviction is regulated. Um, a landlord cannot call the police and have them come and remove the tenant. Um, that cannot happen. If that happens, they need to call me right away and I'll run down there. Um, but uh, the only way to evict tenants is through the courts. So these eviction laws uh, were put in place, I'm not sure when, uh, the middle of the 1900s um, because landlords would do all these things to evict people. Um, and it was so horrible, they made a whole, whole area of law about it. So if landlords do any of these things, some of them are actually crimes and um, the tenant can call the police on the landlord. All right. So the only way to do it is through the court process and this is the process. So before you go, a landlord goes to court, they have to give the proper notice to the tenant that the tenant needs to leave. So I went over all those reasons for evictions um, for multifamily houses. The landlord has to give the tenant a notice um, that they violated one of those at fault reasons or that the landlord has one of those no fault reasons, like they're gonna move in. When I say they have to give them a notice, I don't just mean give, I mean um, notice is a legal technical term and it's got to be done properly. It's got to be hand delivered to a, a certain person, not just anyone on the property, or it's got to be nailed and mailed. So these technical requirements um, seem a little outlandish, but it's the only way that landlords can get into the eviction court and the eviction court works really fast. So you see number five here, it all happens after the landlord files in court, the sheriff might come and remove the person within one month. If you were to go to court for a breach of contract claim, uh, it would take a year and a half before anything happened. So for landlords to get access to this process, they have to do everything right. Now, if the tenant doesn't have uh, someone like me to help them, uh, then they don't know about these technical things. They have no defense. So um, with these laws, these eviction protections that we have in California, which were only passed less than two years ago, so they're relatively new, we do have some defense um, to a lot of evictions that are happening. So 
Um, after the landlord gives that notice, if the tenant doesn't leave, they have to file that eviction case. And I'll show you what that paper looks like in a minute. Um, the tenant has five days, um, business days to respond, or the court will assume they have nothing to say and um, could find for the landlord. Uh, if the tenant does have something to say, like, hey, this notice, uh, you know, says something that's not in the law, um, they can file with the court uh, an answer, and then there's a trial. And if they win or lose the trial, um, they get to stay or the sheriff will come within a couple weeks and actually remove them. So that's the whole process. So um, a lot of landlords give three day notices every month to, call, to tenants um, for late payments, but nothing ever happens. And then sometimes they'll give one notice and they'll go to court. So you've you got to take any notice from landlords really seriously and recommend referring that. All right, so rent increases. A uh, very common question. This is the same thing on the multifamily and single family homes. Multifamily homes can only go up twice a year and the total amount in any calendar year can't be more than between five or 10% by law. And this is also a new law. So that's actually 9% this year. And the landlord has to give a written notice and they have to do the notice the correct way. Single family homes, there's no restriction, um, just that there are anti price gouging laws in states of emergency, which I believe we're still in, and that would limit any increase to 10%. All right. So I'll just say, because I've got a few minutes, um, we're, we still have one more thing to talk about. But for evictions, what um, one of my favorite things to do is when we are in court um, to get the landlord on one of those technical violations and have the tenant stay, remain housed. That's really the best thing we can do for someone. Um, often it's not permanent. The landlord can give a different notice if they, if for instance, their son is really moving in. Um, but even still, we kept the tenant housed for another couple months and they're able to find um, housing and not be homeless for any period of time. So uh, we like doing that. All right. Running a little late, so I'm just gonna push through this. The special COVID eviction protections. It's a little late. Is the, is the summary, but the best thing people can do is talk to you and apply for rental assistance as soon as possible. Um, and they might be protected from eviction. That's the summary. Um, we're gonna do a, a little dive with some examples though. Um, okay, so there's a whole history of these moratoriums and they've all changed and it's been impossible to keep up with unless this is your job. Fortunately, it is my job, but I'll just tell you about the most recent thing, spare you all the other stuff. So um, folks who couldn't pay their rent due to COVID, basically people who, who qualify for ERAP are protected from eviction, but only from the beginning of the pandemic through the end of September, which already, already passed. So the landlords you know, are still owed the money, of course, they can go to small claims court. It would be much better to go to you and, and get the money. Um, right, and then the last thing here is of course the ERAP program. So, so tenants do have to do things to qualify, but just wanna state that you know it doesn't protect, people thought it was a full moratorium, but landlords can still evict for all those reasons that I just talked to you about. People who miss rent starting October 1st and onwards, um, lease violations, owner move-in, all those, all those just causes that I told you about. So I know you're saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. But all these tenants owe rent after October that we're helping, the landlords aren't doing it. That's a great thing. And so that's why we want the tenants to apply and tell the landlords that they've applied. And that's stopping, I think, most landlords from just going right ahead with eviction because they know that a check is being written somehow um, by the government for them. 
So if a landlord does want to evict someone for owing rent during that protected period, that's from the start of COVID through September, they have to do all this stuff. Um, and the further we get away from that period, the less we're going to see these cases. But the landlord has to actually apply for the assistance themselves, get denied, or have the tenant not apply and not answer. So that's why we tell tenants to alert the landlords that they apply because the landlord literally has to check a box on a form to file the eviction case that says, I haven't heard from the tenant that they've applied. Um, landlord also has to give them all these notices and of their rights under the law. So it, it gets pretty difficult for especially small landlords to do this properly. So tenants have to apply for rental assistance, but also return that declaration. And it looks like this. It's pretty similar to the requirements for ERAP, you know, if they've been affected economically by COVID. So let's take a look real quick at some notices that are really common. So there's the three day notice, which I told you about a lot of those at fault eviction reasons like having a dog or, you know, parking in the wrong place or breaking the lease or even not paying rent. Uh, if you don't pay on the first, a lot of landlords will give you that three day notice, pay rent or quit, which means leave uh, within three days. So, and then those no fault eviction notices, those are often 60 days. People on, on section eight have different rights. They get 90 days if they're being evicted. And then uh, we'll take a look at eviction papers. So um, there is no standard You'll see this one says the California Apartment Association. You know, uh, I can usually tell by how the form looks, uh, how sophisticated the landlord is. This is uh, a court document. So this is a summons, which means you need to come to court or you're going to lose. Um, and it's signed by the clerk here. This means someone's being sued. There is a case in court against them. They need to urgently find me um, for me to help them like the same day because there's only five days to answer this um, so people will call you and they'll call us and they'll say i'm getting evicted i was given eviction papers that could mean anything it could mean this it could mean one of these notices um, so we, we need to take a look at it and you need to refer them um, you can clarify and say is it from the court if it is, um, put that in the referral information, that would be helpful. Okay. So I've got some examples. All right, for the COVID protections. Okay. So if John lost his job due to COVID and I couldn't pay rent all the way from January to August, but then I was rehired, um, what do I need to do to qualify? for the eviction protections. Okay, we'll make it easy. I need to apply for the rental assistance program as soon as possible, tell my landlord about it. That protects me. If I got notices from my landlord, I have to return those now within three days. Then I will be fully protected and I can never be evicted for owing all that rent in the past. Okay. Harder question. Uh, if I live in a house where there's other people there and I get a notice to leave and it says, you're being evicted, um, you know, be out by this date. What do I do to qualify for the protections? So the landlord gave me a bad notice, right? Because I'm in a multifamily house I need, um, I have just cause protection. So the landlord needs to give me a notice that either I did something wrong or one of those reasons, like the owner move in or the remodel, they can't just give me a blank notice that gives no reason. So if I owe rent, I should apply for rental assistance and tell the landlord. Okay, we've got a really good question from Kelly. What if the county rental assistance program is out of money? Is the client still protected? 
So <laughs> can I actually rephrase yeah. that? Because it okay. really sounds like well, I guess what I mean is if, if they, they applied but before they could get assistance, the program runs out of money, what happens to them? Yeah, so I haven't faced this yet. Something about the law that's helpful to understand is all these laws are written in the middle of the night, the day before things are expiring by, you know, staffers who are, you know, bleary eyed. So they don't often anticipate every possible situation. Um, for people who owe money during that protected period, right, if, if people owe money after October, there are no eviction protections um, specifically to owing rent. But from that other period, um, the landlord would have to show that they gave all those notices properly. Um, if the tenant signed that paper saying they have COVID hardship and they applied for rental assistance, they should be good. I think if, if the landlord was rejected from the from the ERAP program, then they might be able to evict them. I actually have to look into that. And that you're right, that is a problem that we're probably going to see. You you tell me when I expect to see that. Um, maybe in the next couple of months. Yeah, probably not till the new year. I mean, definitely not till the new year, but. Because we, we've we always might, been we, saying we might get more funding too, but I'm just right. trying to anticipate. Yeah. Um, once a year goes by, um, then I, I think we'll be good. Uh, landlords can't. They have to have given a notice of owing rent within a year. Um, and then when landlords keep accepting money, so if if Kelly's my tenant and she doesn't pay me December, but then I accept January rent, I accept February rent. It's kind of a waiver of my rights to, to evict her over that other stuff from before. So uh, the answer is kind of an, um, I've got to look into it. It might not even be clear in the law <laughs> when I do, and there might be other exceptions. So yeah. Uh, annoying legal answer. I apologize. That's okay. There's also a question from Beatrice in the chat. Um, what if someone owes rent from the March 1st to September 30th period, but didn't apply for assistance until after September 30th? Do they still have protection? Um, it depends. So if the landlord was giving them that declaration and all the proper notices, and the tenant was ignoring them and not applying, then the landlord, and I've been to court on this issue uh, a few times when the people don't return the declaration, um, the tenant is not, is not really protected. So what's more often the case, if someone comes to my office now and, and they haven't been paying rent for all that time, probably the landlord is a little disorganized and hasn't given them all the required documentation. So now for the tenant to, to get protected, they should apply the rental assistance, tell the landlord and return any of those declarations the landlord gives them, or we can help them just send the landlord a declaration and they would be protected um, forever from that period. So yeah, people still have the protection from those earlier months but it depends, yeah. All right. Ooh, we gotta speed up. Okay, third example. So if I couldn't pay rent on October 1st, since I, since I couldn't find a new job and my landlord gave me all the proper notices, okay, do I have protections? Question for people. We got to go. Um, I don't have any rental protections um, because of not paying rent after October, right? The protected period was just through September. But anyway, I should apply for rental assistance because like I said, landlords 
like to see that their money is coming to them from somewhere and that might in you know in their goodwill um, keep them from evicting people okay on to the last part of this last couple slides um, how to get us clients use the srn asterisk um, someone was trying to send us a referral and it didn't go through so i, I got a little worried the srn isn't working if you've referred us a client, could you just mention that in the chat um, right now or in the next few minutes, just say we referred a couple clients or something like that. But um, I think the SRN is working and Kelly's going to talk about that in a minute. Um, so there are other legal aid organizations. There's California Rural Legal Assistance, CRLA. They have some immigration restrictions, but, but they're wonderful. Of course, we're your number one uh, referral. There's also the self-help center in Monterey. Um, if someone has an eviction and you know they can't get in touch with us in time or um, family law or anything like that, um, they can go there. And then if, if anyone's older than 60, legal services for seniors, uh, we'll serve them. So what should you, what should you refer? Really, just refer um, any case you see any of these violations we talked about. We talked about all of these, especially if there's court papers. Um, the last thing, and then I'm done, uh, technical assistance. So WLC does provide that to you. So um, Email me if you're seeing a lot of something so I kind of get the pulse of what's going on. That's always really good to know. Um, if you have any change ideas you want to implement uh, in your city or area or the county, um, I'd love to hear them. Uh, we're still brainstorming for, for some change ideas. And then individual questions. So a lot of folks think when they talk to a lawyer, instantly there's a case in court. Um, so they, they don't want to get referred to a lawyer. That, you know, is not true. We don't, of course, do anything without written agreement with our clients of exactly what we're doing. Um, but a lot of folks don't want to talk. But still, you know about their problem and you want to tell them the right thing. Um, you can email me. I, I can't give legal advice to someone through one of you. I have to talk to the client directly. But I can talk generally about approaches that could be taken in that situation. Um, so, okay. I see Andrea for the client. All right, that's about it. And I could take any questions for the next five minutes, but I think Kelly wanted to just remind folks how to refer people uh, via the SRN. Yeah. Um, so I just, I just did a test. Um, the the reminder is that make sure you place if you're doing a smart referral with the client um make sure you you put santa cruz county as their county um and and this is what it's going to look like you're going to have santa cruz i have a test client here legal assistance uh, general legal services, fine referrals, and you're going to get the Watsonville Law Center. Um, and I just sent a test referral. So, John, just let me know if you didn't get that. Um, but I believe it should work. And if you cannot send a referral, if it says, um, if it says, um, like, a waiver not signed or if it doesn't have a button here that says send referral um you need to make sure that the client has signed the waiver so um an example so find your client um and I think I'm doing this right. Oh, it's going to be here. Okay. 
No, no, hold on a second. Oh, so yeah, it's gonna, so it's gonna tell you right here. So when you search for the client, if it says it has not, they have not signed the waiver. Um, if there's a date here, it means they have. So you should be all set, but um, it'll say waiver not signed um, or no waiver. Um, I think it says no waiver. Um, at that point, you need to sign the waiver for them. And um, it's not in here. Melissa, are you there? I, I just got that test referral. Okay, great. I am here. You're looking for the waiver? Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to remember. On you have to open it. Yeah, so open the, the client, go to information for the client. And then it should be, isn't it under other info? No. Why, something's changed because it used to be. Yeah, this is a different, um, if you go to, what about- Oh, here it is, here it is, actions, I forgot. Yeah. I, I do this every time. <laughs> sorry sorry everyone um yeah so when you search for your clients under find clients you can find the client's actions renew revoke waiver so um that's where you can sign the waiver so there's a few there's many different ways to do it you can just read it to them that's the easiest way if you're talking to them on the phone um or you can have them send send them a text message and have them sign that way but that's just to allow that you to send that referral. So that's probably what happened, I'm guessing, with um, the referral that didn't go through is the client did not have a waiver signed um, and therefore could not get a referral sent. So that would be my suggestion. Just before you go, before you even go to send the referral, search for the client under clients, find client, and make sure that they have a waiver signed if they do not make sure that they sign that waiver and then go ahead and send that referral. Thanks, Kelly. Thank I don't you. think this works on Neighborly. We have a question from Anna. Right, no, this is just... um, no, you're still gonna have to refer through SRN. Um, so you'd have to um, create the client through SRN and, and refer them. So I'm going to send a follow up email again so everyone has my contact information and a couple of resources and things so yeah please please refer folks. Um, the least we can do is tell them their rights, um, even if they don't want to take action on them, and uh, I can try to offer you some technical assistance so don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you john really appreciate it great information. Thanks for having me. Thank you, John. Uh, we're, 